Now we're back. We're live on the first trend, the first uh, think tech um, broadcast day of the year, January 3rd. Wow, exciting. This is uh, heading into our, what, 22nd year already. How about that? And we have Heli Holodnik and uh, Ellie Holodnik, and she's here to help us celebrate that and to talk about uh, trans transitional justice, uh, which is very important for us to understand on a global basis. Title of our show on transitional justice today is transitional justice in the Seychelles. Okay, and the first order of business is to introduce Ellie. She's with Project Expedite Justice. Uh, who, who are you, Ellie, and how did you get into our studio? <laughs> yeah, so so I, I was a, a former intern, uh, legal intern with Project Expedite Justice, um, and that's how I was introduced to, to Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> Why are you doing transitional justice? Why are you focusing on the Seychelles today? So I actually just completed um, my fellowship in international human rights law uh, with my, my school, my, my program in international human rights law at Indiana University McKinney School of Law. And through that fellowship, I was actually fortunate enough to complete a legal internship with the Truth, Reconciliation and National Unity Commission in the Seychelles. So, so we, to, we, we don't know where we're all going, you know, we're at a time where it's hard to predict. But um, are you are you committed to a life in the law? Are you committed to a life in the law about, you know, transitional justice and human rights? Is that a decision you've made? Sure, I, I think it was a decision I, I made a really long time ago. Um, I was definitely one of those kids who just knew what they wanted to do um, and, and stuck to their guns. Um, so I, I've, I've always wanted to pursue a, a career in international human rights law. Oh, what that career you. looked like has, has changed quite a bit over the uh, years, but. Yeah, I'm sure. Why, why have you dedicated yourself to this subject? Sure, um, mainly out of uh, just family history. Um, I, I grew up hearing stories of you know, um, relatives, um, my, my step grandfather, uh, he, his, his family, uh, died in, in the Holocaust, uh, as Roma victims. Um, and that, that really in, inspired me to, to learn more about what human rights meant, um, you know, historically and, and within the, the current landscape and, and it sort of took off from there. Yeah. Good. Very nice. I, I admire people like that, like you. Okay, okay, let's talk about the Seychelles. First, we want to put a map up there. And uh, for those people who cannot pinpoint <laughs> where the Seychelles are, you can, help, you can help them understand. So here's the map. And why yes. don't you talk us through the map, okay? Yes. So the Seychelles uh, is actually a, an archipelago um, or a makeup of about 115 different islands. Um, off the coast of Africa, uh, just there in the Indian Ocean. The biggest island is going to be Mahi Island. Uh, that's where the commission is actually based um, in the capital city of Victoria. Um, while the Seychelles is a, a makeup of 115 different islands, really there are only uh, three to four, you know, it, it inhabited islands. Um, there's Mahi, Crawlin, and I'm I'm trying to see on the on the map. Uh, I, I will probably pronounce it wrong. Um, the the, the uh, that, Don't don't uh, hold me to that. I, I, I won't be able to correct you at all, Ellie. <laughs> yeah, but the the main island that that we're going to be talking about it is Mahi Island. Okay, is it a separate country? The Seychelles. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not a separate country. Um, it's it's really just um, considered the the main island. Um, that's where the international airport is located. That's where the capital city is located, um, and that's where the majority of the population resides. And uh, what's what, what's the uh, the racial makeup of the Seychelles? Uh, I know you have some of these islands on uh, the Indian Ocean, west of India and east of India, and it's a, sort of a racial combination, uh, Hapahali kind of thing. What What is it like in the Seychelles? Sure. Um, so the Seychelles, it, it has a unique history um, in the fact that prior to becoming a French colony, um, it wasn't an inhabited uh, 
the, the islands weren't inhabited and you know i'm i'm probably not the the best person to to discuss the the specific details of the the history of the country um but to my understanding um it was a french colony before becoming a british colony before gaining independence in 1976 um which really leads us you know into the events uh surrounding the, the violations committed uh in relation to the commission itself um but let me the, drop I, a I, footnote I, on that and say that you know this is another story that began with colonialism um and uh people should be aware that colonialism wasn't all that was cracked up to be and when it ended and it, often in the world it ended because it was it was the colonialism itself was a failed phenomenon um and then afterward it left a vacuum and the vacuum was filled by you know political forces that were not particularly democratic so in 1976 uh, they they weaned themselves away from colonialism but only to follow a coup right can you talk about that yes so the coup occurred in june 1977 um the the leader of the coup was uh, albert rene and at the time he was the vice president of the country um and he overthrew uh james mancham who was in the uh who, who held the position of president um, and that was actually the the first government that formed following uh, the establishment of, of the country as an independent country. Um, so essentially, the the first you know established government was overthrown. Then the coup d'état occurred in in 1977. Um, it was a one party state from 1977 until 1993. Um, however. Uh, Albert Rene held the presidency from 1977 until 2004. Hmm. Well, can we say it was a democracy? Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of debatable. Um, you know, up until 1993, you know, I, I think that's going to be a, a hard argument to make um, since it was a one party state. Um, you know, it it is to a certain degree a dictatorship within that point um following the you know dual state um and, and the collapse of the, the the transition from the the one party the one party system um you know there there are more you know arguments that that could be made for for a democracy um and and really the the transition of government you know, to to a certain extent, the opposition didn't gain a real footing until 2016, um, when oh, they wow. when they won a, a majority in the the National Assembly. Okay, so um, okay, so we had what amounted to a dictatorship, one party system for um, from the 70s until what the year uh, what 2000 or so, um, and then after that um it, it became more democratic is that fair to say uh, and you know as you as you see it evolve um into the 21st century it became more democratic is that right i i think so um it, it there's an argument that while you know the the country became democratic um th there's also you know certain allegations of corruption um and that to extend to an extent, you know, always, always calls into question um, the, the the democracy uh, aspect of, of a government. Um, but the 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 dual party system uh, following um, 1993 was really when democracy had a had a footing in, in the country. I would say. Ah, okay. Well, that, that's good. And it, I suppose they maintained a certain connection with their former colonial parent, so to speak, France, uh, uh, well, well, or, France or was, was it, the, or was it was the UK? The, Which one? Yes. So um, the the United Kingdom um, was really in, in charge of the colony um, up into independence. Um, I, I don't know how long 
you know, the, the French had the influence, um, but the language that's spoken in Seychelles is Seychelles Creole. Um, oh. so does that mean it, Seychelles it, English? Um, no, uh, it is, um, a, a dialect, uh, of French. Um, it, it's not exactly similar to, but, um, you, you can relate it to the Creole spoken in the Caribbean, um, the, the closest uh, dialect, from what I've heard, is the Creole spoken in Mauritius, huh. uh, which is uh, the, sure. the nearest country. Mauritius is a, a, a similar island state. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, okay, so um, looking at it now, at some point along the way, and this is why we're here today, uh, there were um, uh, violations of human rights in the Seychelles. Um, and most people who you know, follow the violations of human rights, don't necessarily think of the Seychelles as a place where human rights were violated. But why don't you tell us what happened and what was the, you know, what was the um, circumstance of this violation of human rights? Sure. So um, the the commission was mandated in 2018, um, like, like I said, to investigate human rights violations committed during or or in relation to the coup d'etat in 1977. However, the the event, the violations um, are alleged to have been committed from 1977 up into the the mid to late 2000s. Um, so really, it's not just the it's more than 20 20 years. Over, I oh, think oh. just over over 40 years, almost 40 years. years. Um, because, uh, like I said, um, former President Albert Rene was in power from 1977 until 2004, and his political party was in power, uh, or, or they held the majority until 2016 and held the presidency until 2020. Um, so there, you know, that you can see um, how certain sp specific acts were committed within certain time frames, um, but but really. It, as a whole, um, different acts and different violations were committed throughout that that time period. Mm -hmm. um, well, so uh, alleged violations, you know. What's that, the that connection period. between the the uh, the coup in 1976 um, and these human rights violations? I mean, it, what I'm what I'm thinking is that if you have a coup, you have a vacuum of power. You have um, usually a military coup. Uh, they have the guns. Um, and uh, there, it, it's predictable that there would be violence in the coup. Um, but you're talking about violence and human rights violations that lasted long after the coup itself. So what was the nature of that violence? What was the nature of those violations of human rights in all this long, multi-decade period? Sure, absolutely. So the Truth, Reconciliation, and National Unity Commission um, it is similar to most truth commissions that, you know, it was built after a transition in, in political power. Um, so the, the scope of the acts, um, the, there are the more, you know, what, what we might consider gross, serious violations of human rights law. So um, torture, rape, enforced disappearances, um, unlawful killings, you know, uh, deprivation of physical liberty, um, arbitrary arrests, um, all, all of these acts are, are included with, within the mandate. Um, and, and, the, and these acts are acts by the military? Um, not necessarily. Um, they could be acts committed, you know, by the military, by um, any, any branch of the government. Um, and, you know, how, how a lot of it, the Seychelles is a is a very small community. Um, it's a very small country. Uh, in 1977, when the the coup occurred, um, the residency was about uh, there was a population of 60,000, around 60,000, I think. And currently, there's there's just about uh, a population of of 100,000. Um, so not a lot of you know, not not a huge country um, by by any means, um, population wise. Um, so a, a lot of, you know, th there are allegations and and certain cases, you know, potentially where you know acts were committed by civilians or 
you know, they were committed within the umbrella of of politics, um, you know, by a politician, by by a civilian, you know, acting acting within politics. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily there there is no limitation as to well. I'm, I'm thinking of identity. Rwanda. You know, with Project Expedite Justice, we've had a couple of shows about Rwanda, and uh, the remarkable thing, which you know, people don't realize, is that in in the genocide in Rwanda, everybody was involved. You you picked sides. It was sort of like the country was divided into two sides. And and uh, what, did, what did our guests say? You woke up in the morning and your job was to go out and kill people. Um, and that's you know how you took your sides. You, there was, you were operating on one side or the other. Um, is it like that where you know people, ordinary civilian people, even not government employees or officials would go out and kill people or make them disappear or you know just sort of throw out the rule of law? Um, no, uh, to my knowledge, um, that, you know, and, and there could, there could be a, a different conclusion, um, when the, when the commission releases its findings and in, in October of, of 2022 this year, um, there aren't necessarily, you know, a broad, you know, a, a huge number of, of unlawful killings, um, ha since, you know the the coup, um, and and since that the acts that the, the commission is violating was largely out of this political transition. Um, one way to view it is you're either affiliated with the party in power or you're not, um, and and that's a, a a good way to to understand the the different violations and alleged violations before the commission as well. You know there are obviously these these violent acts that are like you said committed um in most instances of of coups and you know military takeovers um but there's also violations related to um forceful evictions and you know wrongful terminations of employment forced exile um you know unjustified acquisition or, or loss of property um where you know these uh, alleged violations occurred to to victims because they were not affiliated with mm. the government or they were considered they were not affiliated with with the political party in power mm. um or they were considered to be you know they were seen to be against the power the the party um, well, some of it doesn't sound like a violation of human rights maybe it's a violation of a decency and good order Maybe it's a violation of you know you, the norms you would expect in any in any civilized country, but it, 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 some of those things you described don't sound like violations of human rights. So how how did the commission get started? Who is the commission? Um, why did the commission get started? How long has it existed, and what is it doing? So the the commission was mandated in 2018. Um, like I said, in 2016, there was a, a transition in the National Assembly where the opposition coalition became the, the majority party. Um, but up until 2020, um, the, the, president's, the presidency was, was always held by a member of the same political party as former President Albert Rene, um, the United Seychelles Party. Um, and it, it, in 2018, you know, the, the majority party in the National Assembly was uh, the opposition coalition, but at the same time, you know, there's still the, the presidency of, of, of the same political party. Um, so th there, there are some, um, you know, allegations that, not allegations, um, and potentially, you know, criticisms, just internal debate that the commission uh, is run in politics or it's seen as political because it it was created under the you know, under the the previous political party that that did commit uh, or allegedly committed, you know, a large part of these violations. Um, so it it came out of that, you know. Well, it's not external. But it's like there's nobody in, um, you know, the International Court of Criminal Justice or anything involved. This is a this is a a, a national experience rather than an in, am I right an international one. Huh? Um, so 
Yes and no. Um, the most of the commissioners are national commissioners, um, but the chairperson of the commission is actually um, an, an international. Uh, she's she's an, an international citizen. Um, she's Australian, um, and she is a um, you know expert in international human rights law um, and international criminal law. Um, so so she does fill that that role with with a, a high level of expertise and and a lot of experience. So so this commission is is trying to find the truth. It's a truth commission. Yes, it's trying to find out who, who acted badly and who the victims were. Um, to what end? Um, they have the ability to indict um, violator, violators. They have the ability to prosecute and put them in jail. How does that work? So the the commission does not hold the power. Uh, uh, it's not a you know what some might classify as a, a um, I believe the term is retributive justice. Retributive justice. Um, you know it's it's not a a, crim, a criminal mechanism. Um, it is formed as as a, as a truth commission. Um, so um, its purpose is to investigate the complaints brought before it by victims, victim family members, you know, representative of victims, um, determine, you know, investigate these, these complaints, um, determine whether or not human rights violations were committed, you know, in what context, because um, there is really a, a large question of what is the truth um, in, in a lot of, of Seishawa, you know, people's minds. Um, there is the question of, well, what is the truth regarding, you know? The, so how do they find the truth out? They have investigators. Yes. Um, they, and the investigators, I guess, uh, since it's not necessarily a prosecutorial organization, the investigators come before the tribunal, before the, the commission, and they present evidence. They have findings that they, you know, found when they investigated, and they, and they tell the commission um, what happened, and then what happens? What does the commission do with that? Well, the the investigative teams are are, are within the commission, um, and you know, Seishawa citizens are anybody is free to to bring evidence before the commission, um, and and not just evidence, but any you know they can be heard really on 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 any matter relevant to to the mandate of the commission. Is it all um, public? Most of the hearings are public. Um, they are broadcasted, you know, on the. Uh, they, I think, believe there's like a, a YouTube channel. Um, you know, that there, there may be be a website, um, but they are all broadcasted. Uh, not all, I should say, um, but but most are publicly broadcasted. Um, okay. Are, so are they are they planning to make a report? Do they have a, an obligation to wrap it up by a certain day and make a report? Yes. So, so within the mandate, the, the commission has three years um, to, you know, investigate these allegations um, and, and and produce a, a final report with recommendations on reparations, um, remedies, um, different avenues, you know, for for reparations for victims. Um, and the commission also has the ability to uh, grant amnesty, um, which really? I, I, I know you know um, with the, the previous episode um, on truth commissions, um, it is a, a big criticism facing uh, truth commissions, uh, but within its mandate, the commission does have the ability to, to grant. So, so what, you know, what, what, what kind of resistance, if any, does the commission meet? I mean, does, has it got government support right now? Has it got the support of the people? Are there, are there those who don't like the commission, who want to stand in its way, who refuse to appear, who refuse to cooperate? We have that in this country, by the way. Um, I just, I wonder, um, you know, how well it's being received. Sure. Um, so I, I guess I'll, I'll address each of those, you know, um, individually. Um, I, I believe the first point was, is there, is there support? Um, was that? Okay. Yeah, it's um, a government. First point is, is the government supporting? Uh, I, I think that that is a, a big issue. Um, the commission is, you know, they do not have a, a big budget. Um, they're 
their recommended budget is repeatedly slashed, um, so they don't get a lot of financial support from the government. Um, and they, they also don't get a lot of, um, and you know, this is just based on, on my observations, um, they don't get a lot of, of support from, from the government and the different government agencies. Um, despite the fact that you know, there was this transition of power from you know, the, the political party where, you know, who was in power for these alleged human rights violations to the opposition coalition, the resistance has been met really throughout the entire mandate. <clears throat> but um, it was the government that made the mandate, right? Yes. yes. So wh um, how come the government makes the mandate and then the government doesn't support the commission they mandated? So I, I think that that's a, a huge question that that is asked in, in most truth commissions, um, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I, I think that answer may depend on on the individual circumstances within each truth commission um, in, in the Seychelles. You know, I, I think that that is the right question to ask, you know, why why wouldn't the government want to, to support this commission? Um, yeah. At, I well, don't let, exactly. me throw a possible, let me throw a possible answer at you. It may be there are people in the government that have exposure, just the way there are people in the United States Congress who may have exposure uh, for what they did in connection with our own our homegrown insurrection. Um, it could be there are people in the, in the Seychelles government who are afraid, and they, they, don't, they, don't, they want to subvert this commission. Am I right? Is there any I, talk I of that? I think there could there could be a, a lot of different possibilities. Um, in most truth commissions, you know, there, there's evidence of, you know, um, politicians who who were involved in in the allegations, um, who who you know are uh, hesitant to to cooperate because of of other criminal acts like. Uh, you know, co corruption, um, and and there is a an anti-corruption commission within the Seychelles as well that that's operating, um, you know, in in a similar mandate um, and within a, a similar timeline. Um, so you know, and and the Seychelles is is unique in the fact that it's a very very small country, um, population wise, and you know, so. Well, they, got, they got a lot of commissions there, that's for sure. Well, they, got, they got more commissions than they need. What about the other factors that I mentioned? What What about uh, the public? Is the public supporting this commission? And uh, are people responding to, you know, subpoena type process requests that they come down and testify and speak before the commission? Is there public support? I, I believe that there's public support, yes. because. Um, you know the the time that that's elapsed between a lot of these violations. You know, um, truth commissions are are essential for fulfilling the the right to truth. Um, so victims, victim family members, you know, they they've gone years without without knowing the truth about you know what happened and and going years without you know fully understanding the, the circumstances and, and years without having, having a remedy. So I, I think that, that there is a, a lot of participation within the community um, to, to assist the, the commission's investigations um, and, and to, to bring complaints themselves. Um, well, there, there are two possible remedies. One is civil, one is criminal. And I understand the commission, although it may have the ability to pardon somebody, um, it may not have the ability to either issue a money judgment uh, or to prosecute specifically. It can only make recommendations. And since it's a national mandate rather than an international one, uh, they can make recommendations to the same government who mandated them but who isn't necessarily supporting them. Those, those recommendations, Ellie, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, may not go anywhere. Well, the... I think we can we can look at those from as two different issues. Um, so the the biggest um, you know remedy that 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 a lot of the the, the cases that the commission is dealing with, um, obviously the the biggest remedy sought um, is going to be compensation. Um, you know, a, a lot of these um, alleged violations were you know committed within. The circumstances of of some sort of 
financial harm, um, like uh, unjustified acquisition of property, you know, wrongful termination of employment. Um, so th th there is a, a financial aspect tied to the crime. So um, re reparations and, and, you know, financial reparations is, is obviously a, a big incentive um, and, and a, a big responsibility that, that the commission has to meet. Um, well, let me, let me, let me, so if I get wrongfully terminated, um, treated badly in this country, theoretically, it doesn't always happen, but theoretically, I get a lawyer and I sue the guy or the company or the government for wrongful termination. And that's been going on for a while. Um, why do you have to have a truth commission to give a financial remedy to someone who was wrongfully terminated? It seems like the long way around the horn um, to do something that could be done in a, in a court proceeding any day of the week. No? Well, so uh, how, the, how a lot of the, the cases before the commission are, um, you know, th there is an, an overlap of, of multiple violations. Um, so, you know, you have, you know, a, a, a possible alleged violation of wrongful termination of employment. You may also have an alleged violation of forced exile. Um, so, and a lot of that stems, again, um, going back to, to sort of the, the political aspects of the commission. Um, a lot of that is based on discrimination, uh, political discrimination, because you're, you're perceived to be, you know, either against the, the government, um, against the party, um, you know, political affiliation, political discrimination in general. Mm -hmm. um, it may also, you know, force exile. You know, a, a lot of these aren't just uh, isolated incidents. Um, so, so there is an overlap. Um, and you know, going back to the the political transition again, it it often wasn't the case that you could bring you know a, a case in court. You know, under the the one party system. Um, you know, and, until 1993, that there, you know, you could argue that there wasn't a, a civil a civil remedy available yeah, or there was corruption in whatever right. pretended to be the courts there was corruption so you you can't rely you have you know, no public confidence in that system and therefore the only way to have any remedy would be by a truth commission so what is what is your role in the role of uh, project expedite justice in what's going on in the seychelles and this commission and their investigation are you helping individuals are you helping the commission are you an observer or a participant in the process? Uh, so I uh, completed a, a legal internship with the commission um, as part of my fellowship in international human rights law. Um, I was a remote intern for about six months. Um, and then this past December, 2021, that's still funny to say, <laughs> I still, you know, it's still weird saying we're in 2022. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> But this past December, I, I was able to visit Seychelles um, and and you know uh, work in in the office, uh, really just as a, as a consultant to to, con to assist in in any way that I could um, while I was in the country. Um, so I got to you know observe the commission, um, uh, observe the the country in general, um, the the different stakeholders. You know, I got to meet a lot of the staff. Um, it, was a really great opportunity. Very um, valuable experience. Yes, yeah. Yes, very valuable. Let me let me add why one of the reasons I think it's valuable, and it's my last question to you today, um, is this. You know, you mentioned that there was an Australian chair of the commission, that it was mandated locally, as opposed to many other commissions that have international roots, you know, international mandates, international connections with uh, the International Court of Criminal Justice and the like. Um, this, this is in the Seychelles. This is intramural in its own way. And I, I, it's very interesting. You said that this woman does this sort of thing as, as, a, as an occupation, as a career. She goes from place to place, right? And she acts as the chair of a commission that would that would do investigations and seek the truth um, on human rights violations. Well, well the, I, the chairperson is an expert in international human rights law um, and international criminal law. Um, I, I don't know if, if she has 
has been the chair of any other truth commissions. Um, okay. I don't believe so. Um, but but she's had roles in in other human rights mechanisms and other criminal mechanisms. Um, so she has the the experience in in the field of law um, in general. And well, it sounds it sounds like it, it could happen standards. though. I mean, even if she's not doing that, it could be a new generation of international criminal justice people like your own self, uh, where you hold yourself out to be somebody who could advise or chair uh, a truth commission in any country where there is a political room um, to allow uh, to create a mandated commission. And, you know, we, we both know that there are civil rights, or rather criminal, uh, criminal um, uh, violations, human rights violations all around the world today. My guess is that they're increasing. In fact, we, we discussed this before the show. They're increasing. You know, if you look at the, the, the vectors in the last 10 or 20 years, we have more of this. We have more people behind barbed wire. I'm thinking of the movie by uh, Ai Weiwei called Human Flow, where he, he tells us there are 65 million people who, who are perpetually behind barbed wire in camps around the world. And to me, that's a, you know, a, a violation of human rights right there. Um, and so it seems to me it could be a new occupation, a new place for you and people with your training and interest um, to, you know, help um, and be the chair of a commission or be counsel to a commission and make the thing work, make it work in terms of its internal procedures, make it work in terms of its investigatory functions, it, the writing of its report the dealing with the public, the dealing with the government. This is a hard, hard thing, and it's always going to have some resistance points, as I mentioned or discussed with you. So what do you think about that? You think this could be a career? You don't have to be Australian, you know. Well, I think that there, there's definitely an argument for um, sort of the key role that international consultants and international experts have played in the commission and in, and in a lot of truth commissions in, in the past, um, because truth commissions do exist within you know a, a pretty particularized field and, and a specialized field in, in international human rights law um, and transitional justice in, in general. Um, to my understanding, is really you know a, a recent development, um, and, and it's a recent field where you know a lot of people don't have training on these topics, um, but. You know, with that, I think that while international consultants and, you know, international chairpersons and, you know, international experts all have um, important roles that they can play, um, truth commissions in general, um, the, the real purpose and, and the real value in truth commissions themselves is, is the importance that they hold really within the domestic community. Um, yeah. So well, I, uh, I, I if everybody's think, watching them, right, then, well, it, then it, watching, participating, yeah. um, you know, and and to some degree, while you know, staff may not have the the background or, or the training going into roles in in truth commissions and you know other international human rights bodies, um, you know. So training obviously helps with a lot of that and, and can build capacity. Um, but the the unique knowledge that that the Seishawa, um, you know, worker, uh, the Seishawa staff and, you know, other domestic staff and, and other truth commissions have is that they understand the, the context that these violations were committed within and they recognize um, the importance to, to building the truth and, and investigating these complaints in order to, to build the truth and you know, essentially fill the role that that truth commissions were, you know, mandated to create, which well, was, you know, uniting the country and. Well, you know, yeah, that's, that's true. That. But I, I would say that the, the, the country may get behind them to a certain degree and just thinking not necessarily the Seychelles, but anywhere uh, and people may support them. Maybe, maybe the government gives them at least lip service. Um, the real question and I don't know if you uh, have been involved in this. But the real question is when when the report is written, when the commission goes home, when the Australian lady goes back to Sydney, <laughs> whatever, um, what happens then? 
And and if you are, um, if, I mean, if you have a staff that will stay behind, represent the will, the findings, the recommendations of that commission, then you have a follow through. But if it writes a report and the report goes on the back shelf and nobody gives a rip about the report, that's a failure. And so to me, you know, the at least half of the energy that would go into a commission has to be on the follow through to make something happen so that the people who had confidence in it while it was going on can have confidence that it wasn't a waste of time. Do you agree? I think that, you know, one of the one of the key pillars of transitional justice is, you know, memorialization. Um, and I think that that has to do with, with a lot of the points that you're making. Um, it's not just, you know, investigating and, and establishing the, the truth of, of these alleged human rights violations, but it's, okay, well, what are we going to do with the truth? Um, and whether that is, you know, criminal accountability, um, whether that is, you know, granting amnesty when there is full and frank disclosure um, and, you know, and, and other guidelines and conditions have been met. Um, or whether it's, okay, we're going to, you know, incorporate this into the education, you know, let's, let's teach the next generation what happened and, you know, how, how do we prevent things like this from happening? How to mine again? everything they find. And if I had to restyle the title of our show today, the title of our show is Transitional Justice in the Seychelles, I would change it to the following, quote, what are we going to do with the truth, question mark, end quote. Well, thank you, Ellie. It's been <laughs> great you, to Jeff. talk to you and explore these things. And I very much admire your, your interest and your participation in what's going on in the Seychelles. And I think it's only a beginning. And I hope we can circle back on, on this and other, on other countries that you are, are involved with. Thank you so much, Ellie. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you, too. <laughs>